Okay, so we just had the screening of um, what I would call a real rock and roll cinema picture, um, just one I absolutely love, um, by London, London Lullaby. And I've got some of the filmmakers uh, with me here. If you'd like to just introduce yourselves and your role in the film, please. Yeah, my name is Hugo Santa Cruz, writer and director of My London Lullaby. Uh, I'm Shelley Bode, I'm the actress Helena Kutcher. Um, I'm Pierre Benissimo, and I've played three people in my film. <laughs> I am Katarina Normov, I am the editor, the mum. Wonderful stuff, so thank you so much for bringing the film to the festival, Hugo. Thank you, thanks for having us. Um, I've got to ask you the first question. What inspired you to write this story in particular? I know it's obviously, it's a, it's a very personal one, we were talking about it the other night, what the 12 inspired you? Um, the result of the general election, late uh, 2019, sort of certified uh, that we were going to indeed have a hard Brexit. And um, yeah, that was kind of it, yeah. And how long did it take you to write the story of it? You know, how many drafts, what was the process? Um, not a lot, really, I had an idea. I knew I wanted to make a feature in 2020 before what happened in 2020. Uh, but then um, I, 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 I knew uh, Shirley from my screenwriting and theatre circles. And um, I thought, why don't I just write a very small feature with, with that sort of kernel of uh, Europeans in a now kind of a hard Brexit Britain. And that was sort of the start of it. Um, how many drafts did you go through? What was your... Um, I went away Christmas. I came back on the, on the sort of 31st of January. There was an event in um, Amnesty International where it was a... Um, soup kitchen where Ken Loach was showing Kess and then doing a Q&A himself. And I went there with my first shitty first draft, going like, Mr. Loach, would you, would you mind reading this, potentially, uh, potentially considered directing this? Um, and he was mega sweet. Uh, I actually have that first draft uh, signed by Ken Loach. He gave me the address of his production company, said, send it over to them, see what they say. Um, but then on the bus home, I, I, I thought, well, you know what? This is the script I'm going to direct in 2020. 12 draft we shot. Sorry. Um, let's bring in some of the actors. Um, well, how did you find all your actors? You said you worked with Shirley before. How about uh, Pierre and Catherine? How did you find them? I did a very little short film on top of a London bus, again without permits, very guerrilla style, uh, called. Can I say it? Do you know it? It's called Suck a Dick. <laughs> It's not, it's not porno, uh, but it's just, you have to watch it, yeah, yeah. sorry, you have to watch it. Uh, and um, I, I met um, Pierre, who was phenomenal, and funny enough, we have Rob here as well, he's, he's also in it. Uh, and, um, and that's kind of how it, that came to be. And then Katarina, uh, we, I wrote the part for, uh, for Helena's mom, uh, sort of thinking that yes, we can find a German actress in, in London, but it wasn't that easy until my angel came through. And she was perfect for the part. She, she brought so much to it, so we got very, very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. We absolutely love the performances in this. They're so committed, so believable. Um, how long did the whole shoot process take to make this feature? Well, again, with what happened in 2020, uh, the reproduction was uh, a bit tricky because uh, obviously we had all of those restrictions. Um, and then when it came to it, we started shooting in late August and we shot in 14, 15 days all the way up to uh, late November. And tell us about some of the locations. Why were those important to you? Well, when you shoot a film for essentially 10K, uh, where everyone gets paid, by the way, yeah. and, they, you know, and not, not, a, not a too shabby salary if we consider the previous film. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I paid them more. <laughs> uh, I wanted to bring uh, value to the production and hence um, exploited all my uh, guerrilla filmmaking um, abilities going to Heathrow Airport without a permit. Going to Paddington Station without a permit, all over the tube without a permit. The, yeah. You should tell them about your flat. My flat. We are paid rent for the flat. Yeah. Well, I actually <laughs> actually moved in. I actually moved in into Helena's room for three months. It was 
pretty dire, but you, know, you have to suffer for your art, don't you? Absolutely. Um, so, three performers here. How did you work together on set? Did you, uh, you know, how did you bond? How did you set up that chemistry that you eventually see in the film? What, um, Shirley, do you want to start? Yeah, it was so interesting today because I know everyone, obviously, all the actors, but I realised that the actors themselves hadn't met each other because, for example, Pierre and Katrina are in different scenes and, and it felt really weird to, to be sort of friends with everyone but they're not friends yeah. between each other. Um, but I think Hugo creates a really warm, welcoming, supportive atmosphere on set. So. From the moment you step into the room, it's like, let's do this, we're making a rock and roll film, we're you know, having the best time here, this will never happen again like this, especially as it was you know, COVID lockdown, we were all struggling for work, this was amazing. Um, and I think we all came in with that sort of attitude and then just made the best of it um, all together. Okay. Uh, Catherine, please, what was it like for you? Um, I just only wanted to add, before we started, um, Hugo made just uh, with his net for, for some cakes, for the cake, you know. And, uh, then, oh, by the way, let's go to the charity shop to buy some bag. Which bag do you like? Of course, for, for the figure or the mother. Yes, and it was wonderful this time, yeah, to spend this. So, this is for, for the woman, what's maybe quite likable. We did it from the start with. It was a nice cake. <laughs> Every year we have uh, these Q and A's, and every time, at least once a festival, someone mentions how important cake is to the production <laughs> for keeping people on yeah. side or for having the uh, you know everyone everyone's morale. Cake never underestimate the power of the cake. Really? <laughs> for us, it was a Turkish restaurant. Actually, we frequently went to this one yeah. Turkish restaurant that was sort of the catering for the festival. Yeah, fantastic. Come back tomorrow. The queen of cake will be here. Oh. <laughs> So Pierre, um, you play multiple parts. How did you prepare for that? How did you get in that mindscape? I mean, most of it I have to thank Hugo for, it, obviously. And I'd like to add on what uh, Shirley said beforehand, is that um, to create this chemistry for everyone to work together. Um, I, I've only met Katrina right now, yeah. right before the screening. We've never met before. And really, that's, I think, Hugo's approach to picking really the charming parts and making them work the way he wants them to. And that is, I think, really, I mean, yeah, that's what makes a great movie, is really the idea and the projection. Um, and I think everyone saw that tonight. And I think also a lot of rehearsal time for us, like the use of all the yeah. different yeah. roles. I think we had like one rehearsal day for each role that you were playing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's a real, um, you know, it's a heavy part. Lots of very unfortunate things happen to your character. I know, I know it's film, it's not real, obviously, but they must take a toll. Does that take, you know, how, does, how do you react to some of the things your character goes through? It must take a lot out of you. Um, well, I think it's important to remember that it's pretense, and um, as much as you can identify with the character, specifically this one, because it was so close to home, um, as an actor you still have the responsibility to detach yourself from the character at the end of the day. And I think just, you know, taking the time after the shoot to sit down, have a chat, have a laugh afterwards, you know, maybe go for a drink or maybe stand in the kitchen for an hour over a cup of tea and, you know, just talk it through. Give each other a hug and then, you know, go home. I think that, that really helped to, you know, debrief after the day and then let it, let it go. Leave it at the door as you step out and go home as yourself. Great stuff. Um, is there any questions out in the audience? One straight away at the front. Thank you. Um, as an Italian living in Dalston, I oh, thank you from the bottom of my heart <laughs> for the wonderful locations. But um, I've got a couple of questions, if you don't mind. First of all, um, uh, you've written such a wonderfully nuanced um, part for, you know, for a lady um, that, with so much vulnerability coming through. And I think um, it's just 
just brilliant how you just um, go into her mind and um, so anyway. Um, but my question in, uh, was about your guerrilla style and, and, and the, the bits that you've done with the permission. And I am wondering um, how difficult it was to do that and uh, how much sort of fixing in terms of continuity coloring and, and all that sort of stuff you had to do um, um, afterwards. Um, which I imagine there's a lot of post-production in terms of, you know, to make it all flow. Yeah, yeah, quite a bit actually, because um, we didn't really have a crew. It was, Shirley, actually, she's been super humble. She doubled as first AD. Yeah. <laughs> so, she was the one going like, did you get that shot? I'm like, oh. I'm going to look at my list. Uh, um, yeah, we had uh, Lucas and myself, plus Carla, who was doing the makeup. So there wasn't much room for, you know, Lucas was placing the lights, but you're right, you know, there were times where and we realized in post that uh, we needed to up things here and there, and it was quite painstaking. We had that day at Heathrow where we got kicked out and we had, I think, one shot left that we would have needed. Yeah. Didn't get that one, and yeah. you sort of edited around it. Yeah, we cut to the tube, but yeah, we, we it's that shot on the escalator, and um, we just kind of we needed more escalator, and it just cut, and we kept going downstairs to go back to the escalator, and like the, uh, the security guards there by the tube felt like there was something rotten in Denmark. And we had security there straight away. But we had everything. That was like five hours into shooting at Heathrow Airport. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was COVID times. And actually there's something, I don't know if you, if you noticed, there was a shot that I really wanted in Heathrow was international arrivals. And, and it's cut in, framed in a way that you say, all oh, rivals. She goes into the A. And that is just like very telling for what you're about to see. Yeah. So like the superhero is about to face all these rivals, and I wanted that shot. So you know, you know, I was like, I, I, we need to get this. So yeah, got. Oh, by the way, um, very nice okay. question. <laughs> ah, here's a T-shirt. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are you size M or size L? I think L. Give me the L. <laughs> I wish. There we go. <laughs> Thank um, you. Um, another question was um, about your experience of London, because I don't know if, how many of you are London-based. But um, obviously, um, uh, maybe, I don't know if it's a collage of friends or, or things that have happened or things you've yeah. heard of, because I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure can really, as, you know, as a yeah. foreigner myself, I can relate to a lot yeah, of Yeah, it's that. a synthesis of 20 years uh, as a European in London. And having, uh, having got my British passport about five years ago, uh, now I, I feel as though um, I have a voice as a British citizen. We're part of a new sort of social stratum within the UK, those Europeans who chose to stay and got British passports. Yeah. I've just got one little observation to make, so I just thought it was brilliant. I, I just love the fact that Ridley Road is, is like the great destination for London. Right? It's just a, such a brilliant locale to film in. Yeah. But I've got to congratulate you because you actually managed to get the pigeons to speak in Seagull. I thought that was astonishing. <laughs> I don't know how you did that. You know what? That, <laughs> That was actually, we had Shirley on a, maybe you don't see this, the seagulls, but you know, that, that wasn't, uh, that was actual, sa that sound from that shot. You're kidding me. No, no. Uh, then we had Shirley with a, with a lav mic, and she was out doing her thing. This is why when she asked some random dude in the street, uh, sorry, like, this is my cat, and the guy goes like, sorry, no English. That was some guy in the street. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. Yeah. So, so seagulls, you know, I'm, you know. You know, there were the, the were seagulls. Right? There in the background, so the way yeah. yeah, that's so funny. Do you want a T-shirt? <laughs> no? no, no one. Do you want a T-shirt? Yeah. Yeah. Come and get it. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Um, yeah. it's just the most <laughs> we'll, we'll bring Kate next time. <laughs> Wait, what, 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 what are you? Are you? Yeah, there we go. Oh man, nice well done. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> now we know what the prize is. Who wants to put past the next question? <laughs> Hi there. Well, first of all, Shirley, I loved your performance. That was just, it was so heartbreaking. Uh, but my question is to Hugo, and that is with your drone shots. Yeah. How many times did you have to do that to get it bang on? Well, first, thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, let me say that drone shots a bit of a pet peeve of mine because there are so unmotivated drone shots in absolutely everything you see. 
And uh, I want it to be the same way that Spike Lee has that kind of dolly shot. You know, and, and every filmmaker has their signature shot. My signature shot, I wanted it to be the motivated drum shot. You know? <laughs> Here it is, you know, you get boom, 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 and suddenly it's like, oh, another shot, but no, it goes up, and it's going up. <laughs> and that's, that's the idea for the drum shot. Now, to answer your question, I've tried myself, and I literally crashed the drone, I was like, oh dear. Uh, but it turns out, uh, Lucas uh, had a, a toy helicopter when he was a kid. And so he was like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think it was like the third shot, and it's perfect actually, because as you see it going up, like there's a red bus going past, and like there's a prevalence of, about the red color throughout the, the, the story, so it was like, man, couldn't have landed better, and just like a really good angle. We had to, yeah. There were more than three drone shots. It kept flying past me, and it was very scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe seven, but not, not because yet again we didn't have a permit. <laughs> well, it was wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Very illegal, don't do this. <laughs> do it. <laughs> was there a hand up? Yeah, yeah, well, I guess you want a t shirt, huh? Oh, yeah, sorry. He said there you go. thank you. Um, oh, yes. That'll match your eyes, of course. <laughs> was there a question on the far side over there somewhere? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yes, I just wondered if Ken Loach got to see the finished film. Um, <laughs> I, actually, I actually met uh, Paul Laverty, who is uh, Ken Loach's writer. She's a, one of my favorite directors. Uh, I, I met her in a bookshop in Madrid, and I gave her a link to the film. But um, yeah, I, don't, I, don't think, uh, I don't think she, she watched it. I'm just waiting for someone to go, hey, Mr. Loach, uh, I think you should see this. Uh, also, there's Miss O'Brien, who is the producer, played wonderfully by Amanda here at the back. Uh, so, I, yeah, eventually, hopefully, that would mean that we, we, we're doing very well. You know? This is a question for Hugo. Um, so your writing process, how long did that take? Was this something that started as a short, or was this something that you know, you knew what it was going to be, it only took maybe like a couple of months, like... Yeah, literally that. I, I, I never wanted to do a short, I, I wanted to do a feature that I could shoot for 10k, uh, that I did not have at the time. But yet, you know, shoot film, stay broke, right? Uh, <laughs> was it your own money? Sorry? Or was it, uh, did you self-finance it? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and every actor was kind enough to allow me to pay them um, with a bit of a delay. Like six months after we wrapped, every, everything was paid. But yeah. Um, and um, yeah, uh, actually, I have a circle of like screenwriting friends to whom I, I'm sending stuff out for notes. And funnily enough, Gabriel, who's here and who was here earlier with Astoria, gave me some phenomenal notes uh, that actually made the film kind of what it is. So maybe, maybe I need to give you a t shirt. <laughs> But uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think it's very important to, especially this, because I was sort of doing everything on my own, save for the great actors. But I, you know, the notes from my screenwriting friends were super important. Yeah. Hello. Do you wanna um, talk us about the, the music? Because I think the music plays a really important role in this film, and it was quite brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I wanted the music, uh, so to be the soul of. of of, of the film, and I knew I knew what I wanted. I wanted it to be female fronted, and from bands from London, who never really kind of made it super big. One of the bands has a publishing deal; the other one doesn't. And there were bands that I knew from the 2010s when I used to be in bands myself. And I always thought these songs are phenomenal. It's just like people don't really know them, but I knew that they would work phenomenally in, in this. And so you have the female voice with the sort of the songs sort of relate that struggle of trying to make it in London, which is the, the story of Helena. Uh, so I think they, they gelled perfectly. And so I was over the moon, especially when, because uh, one of the bands were friends of mine, Scanners, uh, but the other band I didn't really know personally, and, but they were mega sweet. So what I did is I got a deal with uh, the publisher for Scanners, and I replicated that deal with the other band, band called Vuva Vultures. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it really lifts the, the film up. Thank I think you. It was one of the first things that you sent me after, the, obviously, the script was, was a playlist of, you know, these are the songs and they're going to be in the film in that order, uh, just for inspiration. 
so it was always an integral part of the film. I'd like to just ask a question for Katharine and come this way. Could we have a, each one of you have a, an inspiration? So it might be an actor or even a, some kind of artist in some way, a creative person. Maybe that's inspired you in your career. Who would oh, you choose? Maybe I'm too selfish. I I believe in myself. That's an answer. T-shirt. Yes, please. Come on. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, Pierre, is there anyone that... My dad. Oh, oh, yeah. but, but you have to say what your dad does. Yeah, so um, cool. my dad's an opera singer. Uh, wow. And he started quite late, so he did the army service in the Soviet Union, and then eventually, at the age of 24, he just walked into the conservatory, asked them, where do you guys sing? I want to <laughs> sing. And yeah, they hear him sing, and... That was it. So I just try my luck. Um, I think I'm, I have to agree with Katrina. Uh, there's so many incredible people out there who make am amazing art everywhere, and it's always an inspiration. So it's hard to put your finger or like, yeah, say one name, no one person. Um, I think inspiration is everywhere. You just have to look for it. I just um, I'd, I'd like to say that in, in particular for this film, I had a big Rainer Fassbinder moment, and uh, so a lot of it even looks like a Fassbinder film. And I sort of, you know, that was my crutch. I mean, sometimes it looked a bit crappy, but I was like, you know, Fassbinder films look crappy, but they tell a story, you know. And uh, that's that was for me very important, just to always think, you know, make it a '70s German film, and it'll be okay. Is that why the cat's called Rainer? Sorry? Is that why the cat's called Rainer? Correct. Correct, yeah. Yeah, correct. And the cat is, is funny because it's the, the emotional arc of the story. It's just right at the end. It's a bit of a, bit of a nin joke for screenwriters. There's this famous book called Save the Cat. And there's just a funny one, just a screenwriter there saving the cat. <laughs> yeah. oh, it's a good film. Um, just what was your political message with Brexit? Uh, with the um, film, Hugo? I, um, I think the film is open for, um, for you to, to, to tell me what you think it was. What, uh, what I wanted to put out there was my dismay at young Europeans coming to the UK and having big city dreams and not being able to achieve them in the way I did 20 years ago when I came here wanting to be a rock star. You know, not that I became a rock star, but I had a good run. You know, and, and I had a lot of fun playing in bands, and I got to travel the world. Um, you know, but I sadly that's not going to be the case. So that's that was my stance. You know, this has happened, and now this is not going to be able to happen. Yeah, because I, I noticed she wore the same T-shirt when she went to the auditions. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a message behind that, right? Well, it's um, again, you know, there's a lot of taken the mickey a lot about this sort of social drama type of films and I wanted her to be a superhero and this was my her superhero costume you know, super migrant you know? and that was kind of the idea with it I mean again, you know, there's a lot of readings and there's a lot of symbolism in it uh, there's also this game you can play there is spot the seven uh, references to Ken Loach's films so you know, there, there's a shot there you can see Kess from the Labros there's a uh, Ladybird, Ladybird you see it there, there's Bread and Roses, there's Looking for Eric, there's Riff Ruff with Class War, you know, and there's more, but I'm, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you have to watch the film again. Yeah. Talk yeah. about the film then, last question, what, what's going to happen with the film now? How will people be able to see it? Will they be able to see it again? Uh, hopefully, we have a sales agent for Europe, uh, and I'm keeping a hold of the um, distribution <coughs> for the UK. I want it to be very grassroots, very sort of word of mouthy, so I'm um, thinking of a few uh, um, sort of community uh, outlets where that could be the case. And potentially gets, it gets discovered by someone and someone gives us a bit of money, which would be great because then we'll be able to shoot another one. So with that, we're going to wrap this up and just thank you so much to the filmmakers of London Lullaby. Like one more round of applause, please. Thank you.